The word Bible is the word Biblio, and it simply means a book. Now, in the Bible, there are writings. Those writings are called scriptures. The word scripture means writings. So there are scriptures in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is actually a library of books. And each of the books in the Bible has writings called scriptures. That's basic. Every one of us know that. 39 Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books forming 66 books in the library called Biblio or the book, the body of books called Bible. Now, when we talk about the doctrine of scriptures, we are actually looking at eight major things because these eight things are basically what forms the doctrine of scriptures. I'll give you seven because of our time. I don't want to touch what I can't deal with. Number one, when we are looking at the doctrine of scriptures, we are trying to examine the authorship of the Bible or the inspiration of the Bible. Where does this book come from? Number two, when we are looking at the doctrine of scriptures, we are trying to study the authority of that book. Why does that book have authority and why should we pattern our lives after that book if you don't know this you don't know the doctrine of the bible the authorship or the inspiration of scriptures the authority of scriptures number three when we talk about the doctrine of scripture we are trying to study its inerrancy or infallibility how accurate is this book because it's a risk to pattern your life after a document, a philosophy, or an ideology that is not accurate. Your life too will go in error. So inerrancy or inability to err is the third substance of the doctrine of scripture. Number four, when we look at the doctrine of scripture, we are trying to examine the understandability of Bible. Is it clear enough to be understood? Because at a point, we are going to claim that the Spirit of God is the one that inspired it. So if something comes from the realm of God, which, who is a finite and infinite being? Can finite beings articulate it? How understandable is this document? Number five, when we look at the doctrine of scriptures, we are trying to study and understand its scope and sufficiency as a body of truth that can give definition to our lives holistically. Is this document, is the revelation from this document sufficient to deal with every aspect of our lives? Because our life seems to border on diverse things, a plethora of things. Number six, when we look at the doctrine of scripture, we are trying to study its canonicity. How did they come about gathering these books? And why are these books the ones gathered? Are there no other ones? What is the basis for selecting these ones and not selecting those ones? The people who gathered it, didn't they make a mistake? We are trying to examine that. And then finally, when we look at the doctrine of scripture, we are trying to also study how to interpret the document, which is what we call the laws or the principles of biblical interpretations. When you deal with these seven things to a very large extent, you would have been able to understand the doctrine of scripture. Now, why is the doctrine of scripture so important? It's important for many reasons. Number one, it affirms to you the veracity of that document. Because if you don't believe and you are not convicted. And I'm not talking just religious assent or acceptance. Because if you are a Christian, it's easy to say, yeah, it's the Bible, it's the word of God, I accept it. The day your faith is challenged, you will discover that your conviction is shallow. This is the undoing of many people. They just accepted the Bible without any understanding about it. And they went to an environment where people began to challenge the document and they didn't know what to say. And their convictions began to shake. So it's not enough. We have to study it so that we can ascertain the veracity in order for our convictions to be lasting. Number two, we have to study it so that we can interact with it with the necessary reverence. Because many people carry the Bible, although subconsciously and sublimally, they say, oh, it's the word of God. But they don't relate with it as such. Because they've not taken time to study about the book. So at best, they deal with it as an accurate historical document, not as the sacred composition of the oracles of God. 
So we study this so that we can deal and interact with the Bible with the requisite reverence in order to maximize of the things that God has hid there. Number three, why do we need to ascertain this? So that we can open ourselves to be built up by the ideology of the book. Because if you don't really value it, you will not allow it speak to you. And you will not allow it have authority over your life. Have you seen many persons where you tell them, the Bible said, they say, leave that in, leave that one first. This is what our forefathers were doing. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So they are loyal to the scriptures to the degree that it doesn't contravene the philosophies of their forefathers. But when you study this book, there is a level of understanding that you will have that will make you submit to it completely in order for it to grow you and to disciple you. These are basic reasons why it's important for us to do and to study the doctrine of scripture. And so let's begin taking these seven things one after the other. What I'll deal with here, honestly, is quite basic. Really, really basic. But of course, it's necessary for us to do this. The first thing is inspiration. The inspiration of scripture. There are many heresies about the inspiration of scriptures. Many postulations in time past until theologians came to an agreed position about the inspiration of scripture. And so the first thing I'll deal with under inspiration is to show you how the Bible was inspired. And then the second thing is to give you proofs that the Bible was actually inspired. So on one side, you need to know how they got the message. On another side, you need to have proofs that truly they got the message. It's not just a claim. Because anybody can wake up and claim that a spirit spoke to him. But at the end of the day, there are too many discrepancies that make us question whether it was truly inspired. Because a spirit who knows the end from the beginning should not be taken on a worse if it gives you an inspiration. That inspiration should be able to outlive time. Right? So two things we look at. Now let's look at how they caught this inspiration. There were many postulations about the inspiration of scriptures and we came to discover their heresy. So I list them for you before I show you what is theologically accepted. Number one is the natural theory. What is the natural theory? The natural theory postulates that the Bible is a product of human genius or superior knowledge. This is a theory that these men were so wise. So they were able to gather together wise sayings and they communicated something that is a superior knowledge because they had a superior mentality. But of course, the knowledge of man can be flawed by many things. Number one, time can show inconsistencies. Number two, the knowledge of man will not have the power to generate supernatural happenings. When we see people use scriptures and miracles take place, we know that this thing is beyond man. Number three, the knowledge of man cannot transform. It can renew, it can educate, but it will hardly transform. For a murderer to hear something and change to become a saint, there's a power involved. So if time does not defile it, its natural source will make it vulnerable in the front of supernatural challenges. And if it does not fail in supernatural corridors, its inability to genuinely transform men will bring it to question. So this book is not a product of human intelligence. That theory is flawed. And there are many other theories like that. The second theory is the illumination theory. And this theory postulates that the Bible is a product of man's heightened religious perception. That when men became too religiously inclined, a point came or comes where on the strength of their religiosity and fanatism, they begin to have esoteric feelings esoteric apparitions and on the strength of those esoteric experiences they can write things so it's their religious persuasion that made them to write those things it's not necessarily from god but when we study the scriptures even the testimony of scripture defies that because scripture itself proves that god revealed it glory to god so that's a theory there's another theory called the mechanical theory in the mechanical theory uh, it was postulated that god shut down the minds of the people and dictated the Bible for them, word for word. So they were operating like typewriters. But when we read the scripture, we see that that is not true. Because when you start studying the Bible, you are going to see that the scripture is influenced by the personalities of the writers. You are going to see that the scripture is influenced by historical backgrounds. You are going to see that scriptures is influenced by the belief system and the ideology of different territories part time. 
That means the personalities of the people also participated. They were not reduced to typewriters to dictate verbatim what God spoke. Are you following that? Then you have the fourth theory, which is what we call the trans theory. In the trans theory, it was believed that these people had visionary apparitions. And they saw, it's like the dictating theory also. But in this case, they didn't hear. They saw visions where they wrote what they saw word for word. Are you following? But of course, the very reason I gave for the mechanical theory also flaws this theory. The fifth theory is the theory of partial inspiration. And this theory postulates that only part of the Bible is inspired. The Bible is not completely the word of God. And why do they postulate this theory? They say even Satan spoke in the Bible. Men who didn't know God spoke in the Bible. So we cannot claim that the Bible is, a, is the complete word of God. But you see, when we talk about inspiration of scriptures, we are not just saying the things God said. We are also saying the things God allowed to be written by reason of his authority. Now, this room where we are now, listen this. Everybody who entered this room, entered this room on the strength of the authority of EJMI. So the moment you came here, you came under the government of what we are doing here. You can't come here now and start dancing. While I'm talking here, you start jumping and dancing. No. Even if you come here with your own agenda, so long as you are here now, you will come under the government of our operation. So even the things the devil said, it was God who allowed it to be included in the Bible because he had a purpose in God's agenda. So although God was not the one who said it, but God was the one who allowed it to be part of the document. So at that point, the things the devil was saying has an impact in God's agenda. So it becomes something under God's authority and allowance. Same with the things men said. So when we are dealing with the story of inspiration, we are dealing with the fact, not just the fact that God alone was the one who spoke. We are dealing with the fact that everything captured there is consistent with the will of God. In that God was the one who allowed them to capture it and to document it because it has a place in God's corporate agenda. So the things the devil said are not words spoken by God, but God was the one who inspired it to be captured in scripture. On the strength of that, the agenda of God has something to do with it. So it comes under the government of God's will. That is why it is part of scripture. Are you following this? Number four, which number six rather, the last theory is the thought theory. The thought theory insists that God gave them the thoughts and they wrote it the way they wanted. But this theory cannot be consistent because man fluctuates. So what if you are writing while you are happy? You got tired. You came back when you were sad. You, and you, you got tired. You came back when you were betrayed. The book will not have coherence. <laughs> so God can't take the risk of just giving them the thought and say, write it the way you want. That can be a textbook. Paul had parchments. They were not scriptures. There was a difference between Paul's parchments and the scriptures that Paul wrote. Paul said to one of his disciples to come with his parchment when he's coming. So he knew the difference between parchment and scriptures. Parchments are his thoughts. Scriptures are the word that God gave him. So what is the theory of biblical inspiration? The theory of biblical inspiration is called the Weber plenary theory. The Weber plenary theory. What does this mean? This theory simply postulates that the things that were written in scripture, it was given by God to the writers through words. And this, these things that were given to the writers through words followed three governments or three protocols. Number one, revelation. Number two, inspiration. And number three, illumination. And I explain to you how these three things happen. The Weber plenary theory postulates that what? The things written in scriptures were given by God through words and they followed the principle of revelation illumination and inspiration now according to this theory what is revelation revelation is god imparting the truth that he wanted them to communicate into their heart it's like god photographed what he wanted them to say into their heart so that the things that were the thoughts of god became their thoughts it descended like a download into them. That's revelation. It is divine impartation of knowledge. Then you have inspiration. What is inspiration? According to this theory, inspiration 
according to this theory, is God guiding their souls to be able to receive completely everything he has imparted. You know there are certain things that can come into your mind, but your mind can't receive them. That's why you have subconscious memory, you have conscious memory. So on one part, God imparted the revelation or the truth, which is revelation. Then God now guided their souls to be able to pick what he gave them completely, not to be contaminated by their own deficiencies. So I can be angry, but God imparts a word of joy in my spirit. God now guides my soul to receive everything he says about joy, and he also prevents my soul from allowing my anger contaminate what he said about joy. So I can be angry, yet I'm writing about joy. So the joy that I am feeling while I'm writing is a spiritual joy. It's not something that is happening because of my circumstances. So divinely, God imparts the word, and divinely, God coordinates and controls your soul to pick everything he has imparted and only the things he has imparted. And then you have illumination. Illumination is God elevating your soul to a frequency where you interact with him and him only. So when the people were inspired, they received what was in the heart of God. Their soul was guided to receive only what God deposited and their soul was also elevated to interact with only God at the time when they were receiving it. In, in, in a normal human context, let me give you an instance of what happens. As you are seated now, imagine that you've not seen the president before and suddenly the president calls you. You know that while you are standing before him, all your attention will be arrested momentarily. Have you, have you had that experience before? When you are standing before somebody, you reverse so much. A point, you will literally be arrested. All your attention will be glued to him. But what is happening here is superior. So in Revelation, God downloaded. So God stepped down his truth into their hearts. In inspiration, God guided their soul to receive only the download. And in illumination, God hijacked them up. So that they go beyond their human limitations. And they receive only what is divinely inspired. So at the time when they received the scripture, everything God downloaded, their soul was able to articulate them. And only those things were their souls interacting with at that time. This is how scriptures were inspired. So when the Bible speaks about the scriptures being inspired, it's talking about three things happening at the same time. Revelation, illumination, and inspiration. Revelation is God imparting knowledge. Inspiration is God controlling the soul to receive everything and only the things he imparted. And illumination is God upgrading the soul of the one receiving so that they can be able to interact with God at that level. This is the technology by which the scriptures were received. And if you study the Bible, you will find it. Second Peter 1 verse 20, he said, knowing this first, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Next verse 21, it said, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Are you seeing what's happening here? God hijacked them beyond the frequency of their soul. So they were not operating at the level of their soul. This is what? Illumination. He jacked them up to a higher realm and ascended realm. So they were operating beyond their will. They were operating beyond their mind. They were operating beyond their emotion. There was an upgrade. He said, prophecy came not. Now, what does he mean came? That's revelation. God sent it, imparted it. He sent the truth to their realm and then he hijacked their soul up. It's just like meeting at some point where God steps down from his realm and steps you up from your realm so that there's a convergence point, a point where corruption can't exist. So prophecy came which is revelation, holy men did not speak at their level of their will, they ascended beyond their emotion. He now added something. He said, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. This is inspiration. They were guided. So three things are happening here. Prophecy came, revelation. Men didn't speak according to their will, illumination. They were guided, inspiration. This is how God was able to achieve perfection in transmitting his word. He said, prophecy did not come in old time by the will of man. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the spirit of God. He sent it. Men were as elevated to catch it. And their souls were guided to receive it without contamination. And this is what happened with every scripture, including what Satan said. God trapped it, sent it to their soul, and they caught it. Ask yourself the question, were they there when Satan was talking? So who told them what Satan said? 
It was not Satan that told them. It was God who sent what Satan said to them. Hear what the devil is saying. Upgraded them to receive it so that they can articulate it for a generation to learn. So Romans 15 4 said, the things that were written aforetime, they were written for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. There is so much we learn from the errors of Satan. In fact, the errors of Satan can build faith in your heart. He said, if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It makes you know that they said the devil is. So God was deliberate about what he was doing. Are you following this? So this is the theory of the inspiration of the word of God. If anybody tells you that the word of God is filled with error, bring him here. Let him understand 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Revelation was sent from the realm of God. The source of men were illuminated, upgraded beyond their will, beyond their emotion, beyond their human limitation. So they, they didn't they didn't let go of their humanity, but they went beyond their human limitation. So emotions can still be there, but emotion can't interfere. The mind can still be there, the mind can't interfere. The will can be there, the will can't interfere. That's why the Bible is speaking in 1 Peter 1 9. He said the things they prophesied, they didn't know what it meant. So they were upgraded beyond their mind. They were writing things beyond their learning. So that their minds, their emotions, and their will can't corrupt it. Although the mind, emotion, will is still there, but operating beyond it. And then they were carried. That means the soul was guided. God made sure he protected the boundary of the soul so that nothing can infiltrate it. So when the scriptures were isolated, everything was captured exactly how it was in the heart of God. Are you following this? This is the principle of inspiration. And this is what applies to every scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16, it said every scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Not some scripture. Every scripture. It's important to know this. You know, the world has become a smaller community because of internet. You may be here and you say, well, why are we doing this? Some of us interact with the Western world now than we interact with our world here. Because of internet. So that you don't see things and you begin to wonder what's going on. This is why truths like this are important. And it will amaze you that even pastors have not taken time to study these things. It will amaze you. You need to know how your scriptures came. They came from God. This is not a product of human intelligence. And these things are not corrupted because men received them. There was a way God prepared the men who received them. Holy men were carried by the Spirit of God. Mind controlled to receive everything and only what God gave. This is the first aspect. What are the proofs of inspiration? I give you five of them quickly. Number one. Number one proof of inspiration is the testimony of scripture. Scripture itself testifies for itself that it was inspired. And I quoted one for you already. 2 Timothy 3.16. It says every scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That scripture, talking scripture. Every scripture is given. So that's the first proof of inspiration. Second proof of inspiration is the testimony of the authors. I quoted already 2 Peter 1 verse 20 and 22. This was Peter talking. In verse 16, he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. What is that sure word of prophecy? The scripture. And Peter came to say this. He said, knowing this first. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved. So these are those who wrote talking. This is Peter talking. When I wrote the Bible, I was moved. I was carried. I wasn't writing because I was intelligent. The force of God controlled my mind, elevated my mind, and I received the download. That was how I came about this. This is not because I'm experienced. This is not because I'm smart. This is not because I'm intelligent. I was carried. So the one who wrote it, the one who was used to communicate it, is giving you the testimony. Paul spoke in Galatians chapter 1 verse 12. He said, the gospel that I preached, I wasn't taught of a man. He said, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the testimony of another author. I wrote these things by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And these people knew. Peter was now talking about what Paul wrote. Because if they spoke about themselves only, you will assume that, oh, maybe it's for themselves. How about others? Peter was now talking about Paul. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, hear what Peter said. He said, go to verse 15. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given to him, given unto him that he has written unto you. So the, the wisdom by which he wrote it was not his own. It was God who imparted it. Now go to verse 16. It says, as also 
in all his epistles. This is Peter now validating Paul's writing. Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle as they do other scriptures unto their own destruction. You see what Peter is saying here? Peter is calling the writings of Paul scripture. And Peter said, Paul wrote it by the wisdom that God gave him. So even Paul wrote by the revelation of God, corroborating what Paul said in Galatians 1.12. And Peter is saying, there are some people who want to use their brain to operate in this corridor. He said, they now begin to twist it. Because this thing we are talking about here is superior to human knowledge. Every scripture came from God. Nobody wrote it because he's smart. Mark may, read, may have written, Peter may have written, Paul may have written. And for the purpose of understanding who wrote what, they can say the epistles of Paul. But the epistles of Paul are not Paul's, Paul's message. They are not Paul's revelation. They are the revelations of God given through Paul. The epistles of Peter are not the revelations of Peter. They are the revelations God gave through Peter. That is why Peter said, what Paul said is also scripture. Like the one I said. Like the one the prophets of old said. To let you know the proof that scriptures are inspired. And these things are important. You need to meditate on them so that you can not just know them and have conviction. But the day there is a need, you should be able to raise a defense. That what you are reading is not a history book. It's not human intelligence. God gave it. And if they ask you, how did God give it? You can explain it. He sent it as a revelation. He upgraded the minds of those who received it by illumination. And he guided their soul to receive everything and receive it how he sent it by inspiration. So there was download, there was upgrade, and there was guidance of soul. This is the three principles that coupled the scripture from the mind of God to the mind of man and to the Torah that we read today as our holy read. Glory to God. Second proof of inspiration is what? Testimony of the authors. Third proof of inspiration are fulfilled prophecies. Everything they said has come to pass. The ones that have not come to pass are the ones they say will come to pass in the future. Only the messianic prophecies alone are more than 500. And no one has failed. That level of precision, and this is something that has spanned many generations. That level of precision cannot be human intelligence. You read your Bible, you see Old Testament prophecies fulfilled, and then Jesus came, and the ones he said, and the ones the apostles said, are being fulfilled every day. That is to let you know. Do you know how many forces can contravene what Jesus said, or what the prophet said? For example, Isaiah prophesied 800 years before that a virgin will give birth. I mean, is it not stupidity for a man to wake up and say a virgin will give birth? Virgins don't give birth. It is against biological law. But he said it by inspiration. And then 800 years later, the virgin suddenly becomes pregnant. And those who were close knew that she didn't know a man. And you say, okay, maybe they manipulated that. The Bible still captures that this child that will be born will be taken to Egypt. And this boy was eight years old. Herod came. Of all places, it's Egypt they went to. When Herod died, they came back. Of all places that Jesus can live, it is where the Bible says he will live in the land of Zebulun by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, and he came and found a house where it was captured. These are prophecies given before he was born. You say, okay, maybe he studied it, that's why he did it. How about the Roman soldiers? That the Bible prophesied that they will pierce him on the side. Did they cooperate with the soldiers who killed him? And the soldiers wanted to pierce him. Of all places, it was the side they pierced. Even his garment that was captured, that they will do lot with it. The same soldiers, as if something was manipulating them, they carried the garment and they cast lots with it. What level of precision is that? Even the prophecies about nations have all come to pass. Does it not suggest to you that what is in this book is beyond human intelligence? There's a spirit manipulating it. So prophecies come to prove that scriptures were inspired. It's beyond human intelligence. Number four proof of the revelation of scripture are the miracles that happen at the instance of scripture. Everything the Bible says to do to see miracles, do it to see miracles. And when you quote the scriptures themselves, they produce miracles. They are not words of men. They say this sign, if you follow them that believe, in my name they shall cast out devils. We now go, we say what's the name? They say it's Jesus. And we call that name and demons are responding. Who told the demons to respond? And then you don't even need anybody to come around. You carry the scripture. The scripture says by his stripes you are healed. You now quote it and believe it. And cancer leaves your body. Who educated the cancer? To let you know what you are dealing with is spiritual. So the fourth proof 
of the revelation of the inspiration of scripture are the miracle working power that the scripture produces the fifth proof is the power of scripture to engender transformation look at yourself some of you looking at me here were scammers <laughs> my god you scam 20 people in two weeks all of a sudden the scriptures hit your heart and you lost the desire to scam some of you listening to me here were drunks you see gouda immediately you start salivating gouda 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 some of you is pan wine in the evening ah you go and sit at that joint and they give you pan wine when you take two cups you do like this all of a sudden this same scripture entered you and the appetite died you they drunk what happened there is power to transform to let you know they are not walls of men so they transform it was inspired by god and finally they prove that scriptures are inspired it is uncommon consistency over 40 writers spanning over 1500 years living across the you never hear any messianic prophet contradict themselves. It's the same thing Isaiah was saying, that Micah was saying, and all of them speaking with the same consistency. And then the New Testament ones showed up and they were replicating it. People of different race, different generations, spanning across different times, yet same message. So you know that this book, the one who gave it, is older than time. So what he was saying 1,000 years ago, is the same with what he's saying now. That's why it will be very consistent like that. These are the proofs of inspiration. And it's the first thing you need to understand as far as the doctrine of scripture is concerned. That scriptures are inspired. You know how they were inspired through revelation, illumination, and inspiration. And then you have proofs that they were inspired. Second thing about biblical interpretation. I'll round up in 10 minutes. So right. Let your heart be choked with the word of God this night. Choke yourself. <laughs> Elohim Adonai. Those of you, those of you who love movies, today we will choke you with word. <laughs> if you are watching movie, seven hours, you say, Kai, is this the last episode? Why did they finish this movie like this now? It didn't finish where? Ah, but they, they, at least he should have married again now. At least they should have killed the boss. No boss will die. No girl will be married. Hear the word of God. He says, search ye out of the book of the law and read. None of these things shall fail. The mouth of the Lord, it has spoken it. His spirit has gathered it. This book was inspired. It was inspired. Isaiah 34 verse 16. Search ye out of the book of the law. Read. None of these things will fail. The mouth of the Lord, it has spoken it. His spirit gathered it. That's why it is consistent. It was gathered. The Holy Ghost gathered. Precepts upon precepts. Lines upon lines. Here a little. There a little. Those who don't know how to guide. Who are not guided by the Holy Ghost. To, to gather the puzzle. They are the ones who are stranded. But those who are illuminated. They know. The book is precise. Trust me. No book has been debated upon like the Bible. All the scholars. The historians agree. That this book is accurate. Second thing about. Doctrine of scripture is the authority of scripture. Why should the scripture have authority? Why should we live our lives according to scripture? What gives the scripture the authority that it so has? The first thing that gives it authority is the fact that it was inspired. It's the word of God, so it must have authority. Isaiah 34 verse 16, it says, Search you out of the book of the Lord, read. It says, None of these things shall fail. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. His spirit has gathered it. And Jesus speaking, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew 4 verse 4. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus himself made the book an authority because it came from God. It is inspired. So if you live without the word, you are in trouble. Because your creator says the book should have an authority over you. So why does the book have authority? Because it was inspired. Number two, why does it have authority? Jesus' attestation of the book gives it authority. The one who forwarded the book is Jesus. John 10 35. He said, and the scriptures cannot be broken. That's Jesus' testimony about the book. The scriptures, ye are God's, because you are the children of the Most High. If he says you are God, unto whom the word of the Lord came, and the scriptures cannot be broken, Jesus gave an attestation about the scripture. That's why we cannot not submit to it. 
Luke 24, 44. He said, the law and the prophets, they spoke about me. That is Jesus' testimony about the book. This is why the book has authority. Number three, why does the book have so much authority? The apostles witnessed to it. Luke chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they committed them to us, who were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world. They were servants of the scriptures. They served it. That's their testimony. This is the word of God. We are the servants of the world. We are ministers of the world. So if the apostles submit to it, who are we not to? So the witness of the apostles gave it credence. Second Peter 1 16. We were with him on the mount when he received the excelling, excelling glory. He said, But we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter was saying, We have seen the best of revelations. We saw Jesus transfigured. We heard the Father say, This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. We saw Moses and Elijah stood there. We have seen the highest visions. He said, But what is written is superior to those visions. We have a more sure word of prophecy. So the apostles attest that none of our personal experience is superior to scripture. Look at Jesus' life. Jesus was at the Jordan. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The, the, the spirit took him to the wilderness to be tempted. And the devil came and said, if you are the son of God, turn this stone to bread. If you were the one, what will you say? Didn't you hear God announce me 40 days ago? Go and ask people. I had an encounter. Jesus said, I'm the son of God. He said it in a stadium. Everybody heard. Jesus didn't use encounters. It is written. It is written. It is written. Why? The scriptures cannot be broken. That's why, if you like, go to the third heavens. There's nothing you bring that is superior to it is written. The guide, the guide, the scripture has more authority than your encounter. And in fact, it's the scripture that validates your encounters. We trivialize the Bible in our generation. People come and they tell you all their encounters with Elijah, with Moses, with Enoch, with God, with Satan. I love encounters. I've had some myself. But don't preach your encounters. Preach the word of God. Your encounters can inspire men. Only the word can build men. That's why you find people who go to all these places where they only talk encounter. They are excited, but they don't have stability. Because there's no word in their spirit. They have no regard for the word of God. Why does the scripture have authority? Historical accuracy. There has never been one historical record that suggests that what the Bible said was a lie. Those of you who study biblical archaeology, we are going to see that most of the things the Bible spoke about, archaeologists have discovered. The other day they saw in the belly of the Red Sea, bones of thousands of bones that have been in the belly of that sea for aeons. And they knew those were the bones of the Egyptians that were drowned. Even the Ark of Noah, they found where it stopped. So every day, archaeologists are finding things consistent with what the Bible said. So there are historical evidences. And you can go on YouTube today or Google and type historically verified evidences of Bible accuracy or Bible truth. They will bring many to you. Every day they keep discovering to show you that the things the scriptures claim are actually true. So it gives the Bible authority because it is consistent and accurate. And then finally, what gives the Bible its authority? Again, I add, it's power of transformation. Anybody who submits to the Bible is transformed. So the Bible can have authority. There is jurisdiction for the Bible to be given that level of authority. Now let's look at inerrancy of scripture or inability of scriptures to err which is the third major thing about the doctrine of scripture why do we believe that the scriptures cannot err or there's no error in scripture i give you five quickly number one if it was inspired by god it can't err because god cannot err and we have seen already that it was inspired second peter 1 20 21 second timothy 3 16 the Bible should err if God errs. But we have seen that God cannot err. And so if it comes from God, it shouldn't err. So if the book was inspired, then it can't err. Number two, why do we believe the Bible is inerrant? Because of the testimony of the Bible. Proverbs 30 verse 5. Proverbs 30 verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Every word of God, another scripture says, is accurate. So the scriptures testify of itself to be inerrant. Psalm 119, verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning.
and every one of thy righteous judgment endure it forever. He says, thy word is true. So scriptures attest that scripture is without error. Number three, why do we affirm the inerrancy of scripture? Consistency in fulfillment of prophecy. And I've said that already. Every prophecy that scriptures postulated has consistently been proven. Number four, why do we believe that the scripture is inerrant? Jesus himself said that the scriptures don't err. John 17, 17. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is true. Truth. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is what? Truth. John 10, 35. The scriptures cannot be broken. So Jesus himself affirms that the scriptures is inerrant. Why do we believe in inerrancy of scripture? Historical facts that corroborate the assertions of scripture. Everything scriptures affirms, most things rather, scriptures affirms have been confirmed historically. And then lastly, why do we believe in the inerrancy of scripture? Consistency in the message. And I need to say something here about consistency. Now when you read the Bible, you are going to find certain little, little, little incoherences here and there. And let me outline some for you because somebody listening to me now talking about inerrancy will start quoting something. There are five major classes of discrepancies you find in scripture, but they are not errors. Let me list them for you so that you know and then you know how to explain them. Number one is differences in numbers and certain details. For example, there are certain passages if you read 1 Kings 4.26 and 2 Chronicles 9.25 where the Bible spoke about Solomon's tables where he keeps his sheep and donkeys. You are going to find certain little, little, little inconsistencies in numerical values. But you see, these things are not necessarily errors. These things are actually a product of the emphasis of the one who is writing. Because when God, if two of us are here, Please come up. Two of you come up. Let me show you something. Because every message has emphasis. Imagine both of them are here and they are people that God used to write scripture. My God. Lord, help me. Let me be part of them too. Imagine they showed up here now and God wants them to write a message about what they are seeing. To him, God's emphasis might be about the degree of the transformation of these people. God's emphasis may not be about the number of the people. So when he's writing, he can say several people or 50, over 50 people heard the word of God in three months and they were all transformed and they became mighty. Are you seeing that? God may talk to him to write about these same people, but the emphasis may not be on transformation. The emphasis may be on how many people were attracted in three months. So he wrote about the degree to which people were transformed in three months. He is writing about how many people were attracted in three months. When this one is writing, he can say 54 people were attracted to God in three months. Now, hope, both, you know, both of them speaks about the power of God. But the emphasis of this power dimension is transformation. So little emphasis is given to number. The emphasis of this power dimension is an akazo, the ability to draw men to God. So he gives little emphasis to transformation. When you are reading from his perspective, you may want to floor this guy. They both got a message from God and the messages are correct, but their emphasis are different. So why this one may not give so many much priority to number, this one will give much priority to number. That is why you may, it may look as if there is little inconsistency. But the truth is, the message that they pass will not change. It will be correct. For example, when you read about this, read from the synoptic gospel on salvation, on the miracles of Jesus, you will find Luke talk about when Jesus was entering Jericho. He said, Bartimaeus was screaming. And then you hear Matthew talk about, or Mark, now I can't remember exactly, when Jesus was coming out of Jericho, he heard Bartimaeus shouting. And then you look at it, you say, of course, the Bible is not correct. How can this one say, when Jesus was entering, this one say, when Jesus was coming out? That's not the emphasis. The message is about Jesus showing compassion to the sick and healing them. So their focus was not when they heard the shout. Because if you match the story together, the truth is that 
Bartimaeus started shouting from when Jesus entered. But Jesus attended to him when Jesus was going. So he shouted from when Jesus entered until Jesus was leaving. But the emphasis of the writer is not when he started shouting. The emphasis of the writer was when Jesus healed him. So they will focus on the action. It takes a man who understands the character of God to know that this guy was screaming from when Jesus came until when Jesus left. So when we speak about inerrancy, our focus are not little, little details. That is not the message. Our focus is actually the substance of the message. You will never hear this man say that Jesus didn't heal Bartimaeus. Why this one claimed that Jesus healed Bartimaeus? There will be consistency in the message, sorry, that Jesus actually met somebody blind and healed him. So the goal is the message of healing and compassion, and it will be consistent. If you read about the story of the resurrection, you'll find these little, little inconsistencies as well. Either with Mary Magdalene or when they showed up and all of that. But that's not the message. The message is, did Jesus die? Yes. Was he buried for three days? Yes. Did he raise, rise from the dead? Yes. You will never see any of the writer claim that Jesus did not resurrect. All of them were consistent that Jesus died. All of them were consistent that Jesus was buried. And all of them were consistent that Jesus rose from the dead. So the focus of God was the message. And each of them downloaded everything about the message. That is why John 21, the Bible said, many things did Jesus that were not written. He said, but these ones are written that you may believe. So God is focused on the message, not the little, little things that were not captured in the message. And you also need to know that these people were writing to different people. So God had to get them to focus on specific things. For example, the writer of Matthew was writing to the Jews. And his focus was to show Jesus as the Messiah, the King. The writer of the book of Mark was not writing particularly to the Jews. His focus was to show Jesus as the servant and the steward of God. The writer of the book of John was writing to focus on Jesus as the son of the living God. So you will find same story, but emphasis different. Why this one is trying to convince the Jewish man? That this is the king you have been waiting for. This one is trying to show anybody who believes that this Jesus is servant. And so for you to be accurate with God, you must be a servant. Why John wants to show you that Jesus is the life of God? So that you can walk in the supernatural. So the story and the message will be consistent. But you need to find out what is the emphasis. So the reason people speak of discrepancies is not necessarily because there is discrepancy. It's either because emphasis is different, historical pers perspective is different, or literary style is different. Because when somebody is writing and he's using a different literary style, maybe he is writing and he focuses on personification. Everything he wants to emphasize, he will try to animate it and relate it with human, you know, humans and living things. This one may be using hyperbole. And so everything he's saying is allegorical. You now show up and you are reading, you can't tell that, oh, apart from perspective, there are also different literary styles. So this guy can see 1,000 and say a huge multitude. This one can see 1,000 and say, use something. The number of a chariot. Maybe they use number of chariot as 1,000 in that generation. And then you show up, you are trying to contradict it. This is why you also need to understand the law of biblical interpretation. So the Bible does not have error. And the reason we say the Bible does not have error is not because there are no little, little discrepancies. It's actually because the message does not change. There is consistency in the message. If you read the Bible, you will know that the message from Genesis to Revelation is constant and there's no controversy, there's no discrepancy. God bless you. So anytime, anytime somebody draws your attention to Bible and say, look at this number, look at this, ask him, what is the message? Do you understand the message? If he understands the message, ask him, is there any discrepancy between the two testimonies? If there's no discrepancy, tell him the Bible does not err. Have you been in an accident scene before? Both of you eyewitnesses. Go to where three eyewitnesses narrate story. You will now be shocked what they were all focusing on. <laughs> so God guides the mind of people to focus on particular emphasis in order to communicate the same message. So that when you see from different perspective, you can have the holistic picture. The message is constant. Glory to God. Are you following? And there's also the discrepancy of um, we don't have the original documents. The documents we have are copies of copies of copies. Because the truth is, the original manuscripts were lost. It is the copies of copies of copies. So maybe you carry the book of Luke. Maybe the copies that were replicated were five copies gotten from people who had 50th copy, 80th copy, 90th copy. That's how they gather the scripture. So I can have the book of Mark, for example. You can have the book of Mark. He can have the book of Mark. My own may be 
35th copy. That's where I got my own copy from. His own may be from 58 copy. His own may be from 100 copy. So there are people who argue that what we have are photocopies. We don't have original. If we had original, we would have had a big problem. You know why? The argument would have been that how do we know it's the original? So thank God we have copies. <laughs> What's the beauty of having copies? If I have copy number 400, you have copy number 250, and you have copy number 30, and each copy are saying the same thing, there is a likelihood that it is correct. Because if it was not correct, the different copies would have passed different messages. So the fact that we have different copies from different eras, from different people, and it is consistent, is a proof that that was a real message. See this message you are listening to now. Imagine that after maybe three years, you take yours home, somebody copies it and go. You take yours home, somebody copies, another person copies. You take your own, somebody copies, another copies, another copies. And then after 10 years, they say, where is that message Apostle Mike preached on the doctrine of scripture? You say, Kai, we don't have the original copies anymore. But this person has the second copy. This one has the fourth copy. This one has the ninth copy. They now say, bring all the copies. They now bring all the copies. And they see that the message is consistent. Then you now know that that's the real message. Because if it was not the message, our copies will vary. But if the copies are consistent, even after many copies, then it's a proof that that is the real message. Are you following? So all of these things can be argued. But let me give you five of them. When we have time, we can study them. But tonight, no time. So the first area of seeming discrepancy is the area of difference in numbers and details. The second area is the area of chronological discrepancy. Chronological discrepancy. Matters that have to do with dates and successions. The third area is in the area of genealogy of Jesus Christ. If you study Matthew 1, Luke 3, you are going to see a little bit of differences in genealogy. One speaks of Joseph, another speaks of Mary. It's still about emphasis. So when you talk, when you trace the genealogy to Mary, you are trying to emphasize the fact that it was a virgin that gave birth. When you trace the genealogy to Joseph, you are trying to emphasize that he is of the lineage of David and Abraham. So it's still the same story. At the end of the day, when you read the whole document, you are going to discover that he was his parents were Mary and Joseph. By prophecy, he was the seed of David, and by biological birth, he was the seed of a virgin. So the whole message will now give you the whole picture. But it doesn't mean that it was an error. It's just about emphasis, because all of these things matter to God. The, fifth, the fourth area of seeming discrepancy is the area of the different accounts of the gospel. But I've told you already, the message is consistent. And then the last area is the area of the question of the sovereignty of God. There are scriptures that prove that God is in control of everything. There are other scriptures that prove that we must take responsibility. So how do we rationalize? It's about doctrinal explanation. If you understand doctrine, you can rationalize the two. Yes, although God is sovereign, but he has given the earth to the sons of men so that we can exercise our free will. So the sovereignty of God makes available, the will of man makes accessible. I can make money available in your account. If you don't go to the bank, you won't have it. So by sovereignty, God makes everything available. By sovereignty, God watches over everything. But by reason of his sovereignty, he allows man to exercise free will. So it is what a man wants that he will have. Are you following? So all of these things have their balances. But the problem with many people is that they don't approach the scripture with sincerity. They don't approach the scripture with humility. And approach the scripture allowing the Holy Ghost to teach them. They come to contradict the scripture. So at the end of the day, they get confused. But when God shows mercy, sometimes he encounters them. So that they enter the substance of the message. We are out of time. I will stop here. <laughs> go and read. Go and read the rest. How many of you will read? So let me give you what we read. How many of you want note? Let me give my note so that you go and study. So there are four more things. The fourth thing is clarity. And clarity is simple. Can the Bible be understood? Of course it can. It can be understood. The Bible said, you should be careful so that you don't allow yourself to be beguiled like the serpent beguiled Eve from the simplicity of the gospel. The Bible can be understood. You only need to approach it with purity, with humility, submitted to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing is sufficiency. Is the Bible sufficient? Yes, it's sufficient. Proverbs 10, verse 5 and 6. Write the scriptures down quickly and go and do your study. Proverbs 10. Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Then Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. Revelations 22, verse 18 to 19. See what the Bible said. It said, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Verse 6. It said, add thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou shalt be found a liar. The Bible is complete. It's sufficient. Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. 
Ye shall not add unto the word which I have commanded you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may be kept, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I have commanded. Revelation 22, verse 18 to 19. The scripture is sufficient, it's complete. For I testify unto every revelations, yeah, unto every man that heareth the word of prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him plagues that are written in these books. If you add, plagues will be added. The Bible is enough. Please don't add more. Even the ones we have now, we have not uh, consumed all. What we have is sufficient. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the word of this prophecy, of this book. If any man add, he said, plagues shall be added unto him. And you know, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 said, According as his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we have all. And when we say all, we say all in the sense that what we have in the scripture is enough to make us know God. What we have in the scripture is enough to make us believe in God and in Jesus Christ. What we have in scripture is enough for us to receive salvation. What we have in scripture is enough to bring us into Christian maturity. And what we have in scripture is enough to guide us into eternity. Purposeful and fruitful eternity. So scripture is sufficient. Hallelujah. Then you have canonicity. Go and study about this as well. There are five things that the elders considered in order to gather the books that they have gathered. Because canonicity is simply the art or the process of guiding, of putting scriptures together to make them an authority for the believer. And there are five things. Number one is every book they picked must be divinely inspired. So divine inspiration was the first consideration. Second Timothy 3.16, it says every scripture is given by what? The inspiration of God. So any book that is not inspired, the elders did not canonize. Number two is apostolic authority. Any book that the apostles did not validate was not canonized. And the reason is because they wanted to be sure that the books were consistent with the teachings of, of, of Christ. So only the books validated by the apostles were canonized. Second Peter 3 verse 2 and 16. You saw Peter talking about the writing of Paul to also be scripture. He said that, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. And then verse 16, he showed us how that the writings of Paul were also scripture. The third thing that the apostles considered is the orthodox, orthodoxy of scripture. Whether the teachings of that book is consistent with the general message of the Bible. So any book of the scripture that comes with a message that is different from the general message of the Bible, they didn't take it. Because scripture is supposed to bear witness to scripture. Scripture is supposed to validate scripture. So the elders made sure that only the book, hope you know there are some apocryphas that were not canonized in the early church. You see the book of Tobit. You see the book of Enoch is just talking about angels in the seventh in the seventh heaven. Meanwhile, it's not it's not it doesn't align with salvation. It doesn't align with the knowledge of God. It doesn't mature you. It's just talking to you about esoteric things, talking about angels that rebel, and it even shows you how that some men went to heaven to judge. Come on. So these things, the, the elders saw that the message was not in alignment with the body of truth from other scriptures. So they avoided it. So that you don't come to church and you start talking about Shimiaza. The angel that led other angels to rebellion. And they tell you where he was locked. Oh God. <laughs> Let's just learn salvation and go to heaven. Glory to God. So orthodoxy was the third factor. Galatians 1, 8, 9. You see the emphasis? Paul said, if any man bring another gospel that is different from what has been preached, he said, let him be accursed. He said, again, I say unto you, if any man brings another message different from that which we have preached, let him be accursed. Number four is messages that has influenced the church. So they looked at messages that churches received and transformed them. So if those messages that transformed the church or accepted by the church was inspired, approved by the apostolic authority and consistent with orthodoxy, they also included them as canons of scripture. And then number five, historical consensus. When you bring a message, they check the writings of the prophets because Jesus had validated the Old Testament. Is this message consistent with what the prophet said? If it is not, then they cannot canonize it. So there has to be consistency and coherence in revelation. So these were some of the factors that were considered for scriptures to be canonized. When I have time, again, I will deal with laws of biblical interpretation. I know that's where some of you were waiting for. Masters of hermeneutics. God will give us another time. Lift your hands toward heaven and ask the Lord to breathe on his word in your heart. Ha ha he. He he ha. the 
things you heard. You didn't hear them well. Go and listen again. And then study those books. Study those scriptures. Study those references. See, where the world is going to, your faith will be challenged. Though. I'm telling you. You may have good sensations in church. It's good though. Enjoying God's presence. Enjoying God's power. But where the world is going to, your faith will be challenged. These things we are saying that looks like joke. Hope you know that AI is rewriting Bible now and reinterpreting them. And in the nearest future, they will add things that if you don't know the, 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 the severity in staying with what God said, you may take for granted and you may be doomed. And see where our world is going. Many things will be suggested to us and then forced down our truth. They have migrated from technology to internet to robotics, you know, genetic engineering to AI. And you know, the highest level of AI is from cosmic AI to God AI. There are seven evolutions of AI. We are just on, we are entering the third evolution. The third evolution is general artificial intelligence. We are beginning to migrate from artificial intelligence to general artificial intelligence. Because the artificial intelligence we have now is stereotype. It focuses on one issue and deals with it. But general artificial intelligence will begin to handle general things. But there are seven evolutions of AI. The last evolution is God evolution. AI will develop to a level where you have cosmic AI. Where AI will begin to study planetary bodies. Study their movements. Study their compositions. Study their interactions. And they will begin to hope to create planets. To connect planets. And their goal is to see that if there is a possibility of realms that cannot be accessed. Like Hades. Through AI networking. If there is a planet or a place like hell. It can predict it. And using quantum computers. They can trace it regardless of the distance or the time loop. So that by all means they will look for a way to bridge regions. You don't know where we are going. No. This is why you must know what you know and know it well. Have perfect understanding. So that a time comes when it will be better to die in faith than to compromise. You know the elders died in faith. They didn't change their confession. Lift your hands toward heaven. One prayer. Lord help me to stay true with the scriptures. Ah, hey. Father, thank you for your word. These words take root in our hearts. And by the strength of your spirit, we apply them and we produce results. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sit down for a moment. We are shutting down. I apologize for, for taking your time. It's Bible study. Sometimes it's good to stretch you.